So for the past four years, I've been pretty obsessed with studying uh, the psychological aspects of religion and mythology because I went through a period of mental ill health where I became obsessively convinced that I was, for whatever reason, going to descend into hell, burn eternally, and that led to a, a severe physical compulsion called uh, you know, OCD, where I had to pick up rubbish every day because I felt like God would no longer be able to judge me for my irreversible original sin, uh, having grown up as a, as a Catholic. And I couldn't get out of this mental loop. And it, it really troubled me for a long time. It was one of the reasons why I actually ended up becoming a counselor myself, because it, it, it originally began as me search, wanting to understand my own mind, my own brain, you know, the, the scientific aspect and the subjective aspect. But when I was, I suppose, coming to, you know, to be you know, becoming an adult and, you know, trying to understand how my Catholic upbringing had influenced me and perhaps looking at other religions, I started to see religion not as just this um, separate thing, but as this kind of like, you know, system that has evolved itself. One of the oldest um, creation myths you know, uh, arose from Mesopotamia, where you have Marduk and Tiamat and how the world was created there. And that kind of, you almost see religion as kind of like trickling down into the religions that we have today. Now, that might be blasphemous. How dare you? Um, but from the co comparative mythological perspective, it's very, very true. And then when you start to see the similarities between, say, um, how Siddhartha Gautama, who was the unawakened Buddha, became the Buddha, and, and what happened to Jesus in the desert before Jesus became the, the teacher and, and, and the one you know, that, would, that would teach the word. You start to see, oh, that's actually really, like that's almost so coincidental. It, these stories must have come from one another. And I, I don't want to create this, this video um, as a way to minimize or devalue the importance of religion because I think as parable and ways to create meaning and belief systems and ways that we can be unified, they're very, very important. In fact, I don't believe that we would have actually got to a place where we can say, we can even pose the question now in, in political debate or whatever, uh, do you need God to be good? In other words, do you need religion to find some kind of morality? I don't think we'd even be able to um, ask that question without religion because we our moralities evolved from religion you know prior to religion prior to these stories these myths these legends and before you know prior to watching ourselves act and trying to figure out what the best way to work with other people is uh you know we're just we're just crazy chimps trying to ascend the dominance hierarchy with you know, especially for males, lots of testosterone in the body and trying to mate and, and work our way out. Morality evolved from, from watching ourselves act and then representing those behaviors abstractly in the form of storytelling and things like that. So religion has done a wonderful thing for, uh, for humanity. And now we're at that place where we can ask, well, do we actually need these, these stories anymore to, to, to be moral human beings and to turn the other cheek, pardon the pun. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a video in and of itself. But I suppose the thing I want to come back to here is the similarities of religion and mythological stories and, and what that can do, what that awareness can do for us in this day and age. And I wanted to, to give you one example because it's one of the examples that I, that I write about in one of my books, But You Never Left. And it kind of shows the, the, the similarities between what went on with the Buddha and what went on with, the, with, with Jesus. And Buddha, he was, a, he was an interesting fellow. He was a prince and he had everything when he was growing up. And his dad, who was a prince or a king, depending on what stories you, you read, um, was, was kind of going off what a, what, a, what a mystic said to him. And he said, your, your son is going to either be a, a wonderful spiritual teacher or a very, very rich, powerful king. And he put his hand up, he's like, definitely king for the rich, powerful king. So we gave him everything. We gave him the kings of the castle, all the girls, all the fruits, you know, all everything you could possibly want. And by the time uh, Siddhartha, so who was the unawakened one, um, reached kind of 16, he was like, well, you know, this pleasure life isn't really doing it for me. In other words, there's kind of no meaning to this, this instant gratification life. 
So he became interested in what went on outside the castle walls. And he would start to request um, people accompany him outside the walls and want to see out there. And his dad was essentially like, no way. Or he, he said yes, but he set it up in such a way that made, you know, that the, he, he wanted Siddhartha to believe that everything was good outside. So you can just stay in here because it's just as good. So there's no need to go out there. But as God or, or fate or, or, you know, forces that we, we can't possibly comprehend would have it, um, Siddhartha saw an old man, a sick man, and a dead man. It traumatized him for, for, for six months at a time. He would run back and he couldn't comprehend that um, there was pain and suffering and, and, and negativity out there. But eventually what that, that, that curiosity, that innate curiosity got him to do was like, well, I'm not happy yet and I have everything. So maybe if I have nothing, then I'll be happy. And then he went and lived with the ascetics for six years and he lived off a grain of rice every day and he lived, you know, he, he mutilated himself and he, he um, psychologically speaking, and he, and he, he, he did his best to, 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 to go the other way, the complete 180 around the karma wheel. And even that gave him nothing. So then eventually he kind of got away and said, well, pleasure doesn't help, pain doesn't help. Maybe I'm gonna transcend the opposites and try to live in the middle. He didn't know this, of course, but he just sat under the Bodhi tree for 49 days, 40 days, depending on what you read. And he he had three temptations by Mara, who was the devil in, in, um, in the Eastern philosophy, in the Buddhist philosophy. And uh, Mara tempted uh, Gautama with, with his three daughters personified, you know, pleasure personified, uh, with time, um, and with, with death as well, the, the intense anxiety that we have with death. And then the final one, the final temptation of the Buddha, which I thought was really interesting, was just errands, simple duties. Because you know, when you're at home and you've got like this project that you really want to work on, but at the same time, you're like, well, you know, the dishes do need doing. I probably should mow the lawn. Those little errands can really take us away from our true purpose, I suppose, or our, our path or our, our spiritual mission. And when Buddha overcame those three temptations of Mara, then he became enlightened and he figured out what it was. And what he started to teach after that was what was called the middle way, which is the conjunction of pain and pleasure. So it's not running to intense pleasure. It's not running away from uh, intense pain, but it's trying to find that happy balance in between the two. It's walking that line between the yin and yang. That's a wonderful story and it bears similarities between what happened with him and what happened with Jesus in the desert where Satan tempted Jesus three times and a lot and those temptations were very much around material pursuits um, pleasure in the form of bread where uh, Jesus said man does not live by bread alone but only through the spirit and then what you have essentially is like okay this is a religion well you probably wouldn't call Buddhism or religion, hey, you almost like a practice. Because like, this is how we want to live. This is the outfall path. This is how we do it. Now go out there and do it. So it's not so much a religion, I suppose, but it depends on your definition. Uh, and then you have the story that came from Christianity, which is like, how do we get to this place where we understand what life is? Well, we can't get there unless we go through these trials and these, these periods of suffering or confusion or existential questioning. And what that tells me in terms of uh, psychotherapy, being a counselor, but also my own life, is that not only are difficulties worth it, but I should always be open to learning about how they changed me. So reflection is really, really necessary. If I want to look back and have a think about what was difficult in my life, but what I've learned from those, and then how I can actually teach and help other people that might be going through the same sort of thing. So, from the psychological significance of religion, the question that I pose to you is this, how did your trauma or your difficulties actually lead to intense wisdom or a sense of purpose for you? And how can you give that wisdom to us because we are all waiting to hear it and we want to find out what you have learned so that we can shortcut and don't have to go through the pain ourselves. Guys, I love you all. I will speak to you next video.